What is this fascination with the barn find, the basket case or rusty wreck, that we throw ourselves into a crazy scramble to secure it, convinced, though our near and dearest may not agree, that here is a once-in-a-lifetime bargain? This is the reality, and this is the picture in our mind's eye. It poses two questions, why we do it and how. I'll hand over the why question to psychologists for now and instead run through a personal how of a restoration. And if bench and spanners are not really your bag of nuts and bolts, skip forward half an hour and we'll go riding together. Oh, don't forget your waterproofs. This is collection day, the bike loaded piecemeal into the back of our daily driver one of the Rickman boys' four-wheelers. Phase one is relocation to the workbench. Notes and sketches of the old days are more easily made in the 21st century using a digital camera. Inspection and assessment are accompanied by lashings of penetrating fluid on threads and fittings as we form a rough idea of which parts are repairable which beyond all hope. Some dismantling requires the sacrifice of one part to save another. Nipples are rusted to spokes and rim, but hubs are gold, merely tarnished. The repairs of former keepers may hint at incompetence or a fall on hard times. I counted 14 patches on the front tube, often in huddles like this one. And who in the world wouldn't be able to lay hands on a bent nail? Parts may be absent altogether, stolen for another bike. This panther lost dynamo, amyl carburetor and lights, plus random components of the web forks damper assembly. A distinctly down at heel foot brake lever pivot will need bushing to remove play. Handlebar grips are in a state of collapse, but near-complete Bowden controls respond well to cleaning. POC friend Clive comes up with a missing lever for the left-hand decompressor and advance assembly. One-inch handlebars can be made to pattern. A borrowed tube bender will replicate the original bars. My tape measure collection helps record precise details for the camera. Much of the panther appears untouched since manufacture, most nuts still hexagonal beneath a layer of rust. It's also been a stranger to grease gum and oil can. Marked up kitchen spread tubs keep different assemblies together for when the photographic memory fails. Seventy years on, the original cotton-covered wiring has lost its insulation and conducting properties, but beyond all reason there is still a spark from the coil. I won't risk fitting that to a bike intended for riding when a sealed modern unit will cope better with an occasional jaunt in the rain. Some parts, like this chain guard, will need repair once cleaned up. I'm experimenting with electrolytic rust removal, degreasing before immersion in a 25-gallon roof water tank. A kilogram of washing soda dissolved in water, a battery charger and electrodes complete the setup. The top rail is the negative connection for components. The positive runs to lengths of sacrificial steel in the corners the parts hung from wires. This is rust skimmed from the top. Google for further details. Here's the primary chain case outer as lifted out and after rinsing. It's not a high speed process but it does save a lot of graft. The rear number plate is too beaten up to use. But after a day in the soda tank, the original number has begun to appear. FYN 
is a London series from July 1939. An identical number plate among my bits and pieces proved in better shape. Period replica rear lights are easily available. The original would probably have been a simple fag end style light, but the 1939 James Gross catalogue of bolt on goodies offers a similar light to this, just the kind of thing I might have fitted, assuming four and ninepence burning a hole in my pocket. Motorcycle metalwork requires wire brushing, cutting, grinding, and linishing. A fleet of angle grinders amassed over several years saves a lot of disc changing. The back of the chain case is rotted through where the strap was spot welded on. It's preferable to cut back to sound steel for a simple replacement panel. A reversed gutter reduces oil loss where the footrest support passes through. The position is scribed, cut and the new section TIG welded in. Until the finance department releases funds for a spot welder, I rely on boring and puddle welding for attaching the strengthening strip. A new cover for the lidless toolbox was formed oversize and scribed for trimming the edge. More puddle welds attach a section of stainless steel piano hinge. The mudguards show signs of a hard life between 1939 and the 1950s when it came off the road. Splits in rolled edges are strengthened with wire. The rear chain guard bolt renewed. Simple parts like this toolbox to chain stay bracket are more easily replicated than revived. The Red Panther has four speeds and foot change, a revelation in 1939. Berman's 8 HPB gearbox outer cover had been pulled clear on its studs, but apparently never removed. The lever between inner and outer box rises into the pressed steel cover when the low gears are selected, so the casing moves about three-eighths of an inch and stops. Selecting third or fourth gear has the lever ducking low enough to clear the case. It's fascinating to speculate, in the absence of contemporary reports, why this panther was relieved from service. Rust and borrowed items aside, the major mechanical parts seem intact. It's the Berman gearbox which shows signs of interference, and I wonder what action on the part of an owner might result in the chewed up condition of the gear indicator shaft. This is minus the locating flats for an indicator pointer and the threaded retaining shaft. My verdict, death by Stilson abuse following selector mechanism of failure. All bearings will be renewed. The sleeve gear bushes are turned as a pair, parted off, pressed in and reamed to size for the main shaft. The thread and shoulder for the gear indicator are almost completely destroyed. I build up with weld, clean in the lathe and bore for a 7 16th inch cycle thread. Power off, the lathe chuck is turned into the tap by hand using the tailstock to ensure alignment as the thread starts. A bolt screwed in sets the depth of flats milled for the gear indicator pointer. With the bolt's head removed, it's loctited in to replace the original threaded end. On balance, a box spanner is preferable to a hammer and chisel for loosening and tightening the sprocket nut. The gear change shaft will also benefit from a new bush. With the mechanism assembled, the spring tends to jump off this pin. Perhaps we have discovered the origin of poor selection, which led to further abuses and put this red panther into the dark for over 60 years. 
It proves easily repairable, driven out and replaced with the shank of a broken eighth-inch twist drill. I told you not to throw anything away. I'm delighted to find that Alberta Springs can supply new parts off the shelf for such an obscure gearbox. These complete the transformation. Only a kick start and gear lever missing. The latter is unusually long and proves difficult to find, so I obtain one for a heavy weight which has the same spline and lengthen it. Cleaned and repaired tinware and new unplated rims are given a coat of two-part etch primer and hung up to dry. Grey high build primer follows, rubbed down between coats. These vary in number, depending on how the surfaces come up and how fussy I am on the day. Filler is added as appropriate. Feather off around fixing holes. Two-pack acrylic, two to one, has proved its durability for me. It's sprayed outdoors, preferably before the flies get up, because the shiny surface excites them more than it does a concourse judge. In cool weather I put on some heat to warm the workshop. Parts are hung there, carried outside in turn, and hung back after spraying. Coat 1, a covering mist, is left to go tacky and provides a purchase for later, thicker coats to reduce the chance of runs. Then the workshop is out of bounds until the following day when parts are moved to a place of safety and left to harden for a couple of weeks, however desperate I am to start bolting things together. 1939 Red Panthers used ball journals in place of the previous year's adjustable cup and cone wheel bearings. With modern double shielded replacements, they will be maintenance free, at least for as many miles as I am likely to travel. Unpolished stainless spokes keep their looks longer than rustless. A bath towel on the bench, with permission from an appropriate adult, protects paint as frame and engine plates are reunited. With the rebuilt gearbox in place, I have a sense of turning the tide at last. Long workshop sessions are not always appropriate, but I can often grab a few minutes for jobs like making a new gasket for the Lucas Horn. It seems more likely that wear on stand pivots was the result of a weak spring which allowed it to rattle in use rather than frequent parking. The eyes are line bored and rebushed to restore roundness. Sadly though this Deluxe Model 40 was equipped with a speedometer it gives no clue to distance covered in the bike's first life. The question is why its Smith's chronometric instrument the original judging by its 1937 plate, has not only been attacked with a blunt implement, but still shows a row of zeros on its odometer dial. I think I'll leave you to puzzle over that one for now and cobble up a magnetic replacement to tide us over. Rear wheel spindle nuts are rusty and slack on the threads. I make a new pair from stainless steel hex bar. Check of chain alignment ensures that I have gearbox spaces the right way round. A tyre in the Mitas range has a pleasingly old-fashioned look, though performance appears to be up to date. That is to say, I have not yet found myself viewing the world from the bottom of a ditch. A wheel in the frame reminds us what we're doing here, and with the rear mudguard in place, it looks even better. Overlong bolts on the bracket will pick up saddle springs. I'm keen on thread lock for all those parts which I hope not to remove for many years. The number plate is exempt because we can't apply for an age-related registration 
until we have a machine fit for official inspection. Painting numbers will be easier on a horizontal surface. So at last to the 250cc Red Panther's engine. It had been robbed of its lighting set but the dynamo cradle remained, corroded to the crankcase. Miller dynamo and a headlight are easier to source. Hold down straps are rusty beyond salvage but provide patterns for a new pair in stainless steel. Aside from that gearbox, parts are generally undamaged by an agricultural tool kit, as seen in the condition of rocker nuts and spring washers. Seized crankcase studs are nipped in vice soft jaws to aid removal. The engine, still on standard bore, appears to be a year earlier than the bike. The spark plug was missing, the piston rust seized, but the bore will clean up for a new 60mm plus 30 hepolite which I have obtained. I set up my lathe jig for a rebore with a dial test indicator in the boring bar, run right through to ensure that the bore will be true and square. I am a hobbyist, not an engineer, but caution is the watchword in all such endeavours. Material of any kind from cast iron to knuckle flesh, is easily removed, harder to put back. A light skim, top to bottom, proves whether things are going to plan. Then I set an undersized cut, working towards a thou or so of the target, before finishing with a spring-loaded hone. I double-check with a bore gauge, and finally slide the piston in with a feeler gauge to check skirt clearance by the book. 2,500 miles down the road, my three thousandths has proved quite satisfactory following careful running in, with good compression, no hint of tightness and acceptable oil consumption. The crank runs in a bronze bush on the timing side, a new one being parted off in the lathe here. It's bored for the oil way, and a scroll to distribute oil is cut by hand with a miniature burr. A pin prevents it from turning in the case. A new roller race is fitted to the drive side. The replacement big end assembly was kindly provided by POC friend Martin, owner of the first Red Panther I rode and fell for. The crank is assembled and trued by the method used in the Model 100 engine build on this channel. A second bush is made for the camshaft and with a new small end bush fitted we are ready to put the cases together and ream through the new crankshaft bush. Final assembly here employed a smear of Delta Multi Gasket, my flavour of the month. A paper gasket for the case to barrel joint, more sticky stuff, and with the piston fitted and a ring compressor in place, I lower the barrel and bolt up. That's the bottom end done. The head barrel joint has a copper gasket annealed by heating cherry red in a propane flame. Quenching has no further effect on copper, except perhaps to save an impatient operator's fingers. I'm tackling the cylinder head next, getting it hot to replace valve guides, out with the old and in with the new. The valves are ground in and the head fitted. Five studs secure it to the barrel. This auto jumble bargain drive chain might prove feeble on anything bigger, but it's fine on a pre-war 250. Workshop Haute Cuisine, boiled cork, served on steel plates. I've yet to find anything to beat the performance of cork in a clutch used for gentle road work. Softened, the elements go in like wedges, the thick end tucked in last with a screwdriver blade. 
mount the plates in the lathe and sand them to thickness with a glass paper block in the tool post. Decompressor levers are often missing from panther cylinder heads. The lever and spring mechanism is simply replicated, convenient if not strictly essential on a low compression 250. I've made a new gasket but leave the lid off for fitting the cable later. Oops, for some reason the dynamo pinion that I have is too big. Research shows that earlier Red Panthers used a Miller dynamo with contact breaker points incorporated, which was the one which previous owner Steve had found in his search for missing parts. Main drawback of the system was that it had to run at half engine speed. This model has the contact breaker on the camshaft, so the dynamo is positioned closer to the oil pump, a smaller pinion allowing it to spin faster for efficient charging at low revs. The Panther Owners Club spare scheme comes up with the correct item. Girder forks are lightweight web and it looks as if grease put on at the factory in Cleckheaton in 1939 worked its way out some time ago. Fortunately, most of the wear is in the spindles, and I'm able to open out 5 and 7 16 inch bores to suit rods of 10mm and 12mm. These are shouldered and threaded to replicate the originals squares milled on their ends for spanner adjustment. Thick washers in stainless steel indicate when the slack is taken out but the forks still free to move. The edges are knurled in the lathe. The web forks have adjustable damping but several parts have been lost. Star springs and friction discs are available but I need to make a missing back plate using the other as a pattern. This is a blank cut and pierced. The raised section locates a friction disc. Its two-part press tool is just behind. I've lightly centre-popped the positions of two pips which locate a leg on the star spring. Ball bearings sit in the marks, ready to press in. Here is the result. The lower links are ready for assembly. A butterfly at the rear adjusts pressure on the star spring. The link is threaded and nuts lock its position on the new spindle, the opposite side nipped against the shoulder. Some designs use right and left hand threaded spindle ends working in tandem for adjustment of side play. The valve push rods lack enclosure the builder waiting inspiration. But the Red Panther is beginning to take shape. This is the badly worn brake pedal, another victim of an apparent post-war grease shortage. There was plenty of meat around the pedal's bore, so I have cleaned up oversize, skimmed the worn spindle and pressed on a sleeve, reaming the bore to size. To complete the brake stoplight, I create a small switch plate to attach to one engine stud and locate on another to prevent it twisting. Serial box patterns are worth their weight in cornflakes on a job like this. A new brake cable and we are in business. The headlamp reflector polishes up surprisingly well before fitting new sealing rubber for the glass. Headlight shell threads are tapped clean of paint. An LED battery service light from AO Services replaces the ignition telltale to serve a double purpose. A central light switch and simple single pole ignition switch complete the shell. A contact on the Panther Facebook group flags up a maker of replica rubber saddles. A replacement cover complete with rivets arrives in the post. I salvage 
the old Dunlop name plate and attach that to the rear. A slot milled in the newly formed handlebars. The throttle cable emerges here in the centre, edges rounded to prevent chafing. Other fittings are too badly corroded and I turn new rings in stainless steel. One way to sidestep the difficulty of finding a plater. Home nickel plating is a method I have used successfully in the past but it involves a bit of work to set up, hard to justify for just a handful of small parts. The grips are made from lengths of radiator hose, the throttle araldited to its original sleeve, with a mirror fitted to the end. I'll let you into a secret of the left bar's end cap, it's half a stainless steel tea infuser. These are the twist grips working parts. The double scroll in the sleeve moves inner and outer cables apart for a smooth acting throttle. A large electric iron and plumber's solder are perfect for cable making. Cable strands are deformed to prevent them pulling out. Solder works better as a plug than it does a glue. Cable making on a board, the salient points plotted by screws. I note wire colours onto a diagram and add a couple of spares between saddle post and headlight. Components get an earth wire too. Completed cables are wrapped with plain PVC tape, the ends finished with heat shrink tube. Connecting and testing each circuit as you go with battery and bulb can save a deal of head scratching later. Dynamo connections are output and feed to the field coil with earth via its body clamp. The original Red Panther setup employed a Miller three brush dynamo, but with the third brush removed, the unit can be wired to regulate through a relatively modern unit. This is a replica Lucas MCR2 made in India. Experience suggests that these two coil units, old or new, can be made more reliable by replacing the cutout coil with a diode, visible behind the disconnected coil on the right. Once the regulator coil is adjusted, it copes reliably with variations in demand and supply. Rather than trying to set up with the engine running and the bike dancing all over the bench, I spin the dynamo up in a lathe tool post clamp. A simple press tool made from a large ball bearing and a tube created a stainless steel cover for the oil bypass adjuster. How cold steel responds to stretching and shrinking is a source of fascination to me. Motorcycle restoration benefits from that mindset which never lets anything be thrown away, if it may conceivably be useful. I have saved a stainless steel tube from an old vacuum cleaner and with some work it even gets an o-ring centre seal like those on the later Panthers. A side-on period shot gave me dimensions for a silencer pattern cut from three slices of blockboard shelf, sandwich glued and shaped. The pipe was made from sections of an old car exhaust with a simple baffle tube added when the silencing of an open box left a little to be desired. Time for a circuit of the drive 
with a temporary fuel supply. Success and the highly compromised tank can't be ignored any longer. Knee grip support plate and badge reveal the Deluxe Model 40's chrome and red colour scheme. It's not badly damaged, but I decide to bite the bullet and open up the tank, cutting into weld seams with a 1.6mm disc. Always wear eye protection when using power tools, and don't ask me how I know how important this is. Six panels make up the tank, a saddle and two base sections, the compound curves of the top constructed of three pressings the joints clearly visible from inside. I make drawings with sectional profiles in case I need to create a new one, but it looks better than anticipated. The main rust is behind knee grips where water has been trapped. It's a relatively simple job to dress out dents. Once the seams are re-welded, I connect an air line, about 3 psi, and brush with soapy water to reveal areas needing rework. There's no chance the tank will take re-chroming, but filler, rubbing down and primer in stages, raises a surface fit for paint. Red Panther tank finishes varied a good deal over the model's long production life, and as mine can't be in any way original, I use some license and paint it red all over, and then mask the rear to spray a cream front panel with a pinstripe transition. Tank liner restores the inside and based on past success I use a POR product. When it's cured I clean out threads and fit repainted badges and new knee grip rubbers. Steel tube from a dead folding garden chair frame makes a dual purpose rack and lifting handle. I put the paperwork through the POC's machine registrar, Ginger, who authenticates the Red Panther for the UK Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency on the basis of its engine number. I make an appointment for a viewing by their agent and in a couple of weeks an age-related number is allocated. I print it on paper, stick it to front and rear plates with clear tape. Craft knife cuts a fine outline into the plates. Humbrol matte white is applied, the lines creating a limit for careful brushing. It may not be how they teach it in sign writer school, but it works for me. With insurance set up, it's time for that first road trial. I only intend to go down the lane and back, but the bike sounds so perfect and run so sweetly in all gears that I ride four miles to a fuel station, fill up the tank and come back on cloud nine. I have friends who spend time restoring a bike only to sell it, raising funds for the next, but I derive further pleasure from shaking out inevitable wrinkles, comparing notes with like-minded friends and just plain riding. Today we're meeting local vintage motorcycle club members for a route finder run to a pub lunch. And straight away there's something new and quirky to share and almost brand new Russian two-stroke, a Voshkod, from 1993, being run in for the first time. How's that for quirky? Voshkod. Oh, it's it again. Interesting. Voshkod. It's a Russian band. What, what year? 93, and it's brand new. Been in the second of dealer's storeroom until January of this year. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just running it in at the moment. It's painted. They're all painted silver because the castings are pretty thick. The whole thing's true, but 
it does the job, you know, yeah. it, it satisfies their needs, I suppose, in Russia. I mean, all, all these big, heavy, chunky things, you know, there's no style to it. I mean, well, no, it's Russian. Well, I'd, in the 1970s, they used to do an early model of this, and I had one to go to work on, and it was never any trouble. No. And when I saw this on, on, in January, I thought, oh, I love that. <laughs> but luckily, uh, uh, no, Her uh, Hereford. Oh, it was on eBay. Oh, oh right. right. Three hundred quid. Oh. <laughs> I thought I can't refuse it. But no. no. Yeah. It wasn't registered. I've had to register. Right. And that's a pain. Yes. yes. Yeah, Partially get... because it's Russian and there's no information. No. You've got to get tape approval and all that sort of thing. Yeah. There's, it... a, there's a Russian, a Cossack owners club, Russian out know, So they dated it for you. Yeah, he's yeah. a good guy on there. Right. Um, and sent me loads of information because they DVLA rejected it initially. Right. Uh, but I sent them more info and eventually. Yeah. 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 Oh, good. Yeah. Hands are looking good. Yes, running really nicely. Yeah. Did you have to rebuild the engine? Yes. Yeah. Every, everything's That's rebuilt. A bit of gadget to look at over there, isn't it? Thirst for chatter quenched, we follow the route to lunch.
Barry beyond the town of Oundle, he reins in the Red Hunter and I take my chance to pass. The Red Panther now fully bedded in and pulling well on a gradient. tucks in behind and by the time we make the pub we have gathered a small following. Time for a debrief with the route set at Brian, followed by another look round the machinery before we eat. <laughs> Wrong symbol in there. Just to make things interesting. You nearly caught us out. Yeah, you nearly Sorry. caught us out. Put yeah. the Wrong symbol make a mistake in. on it. Well, you've got, you've got the, the turn is right, but you've got a T junction uh, symbol instead, instead of, of a, instead of right a crossroad. Um, oh, a right sorry. Turn. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so, and we all sat there so looking at each other. I, I, I thought, well, I knew the, where, where we were going. Uh, Bullock Road. Oh, there. And then I thought, have I made a mistake yeah. somewhere here? Well, uh, I but it was, check, a I check. It, it was a T-junction, but the wrong direction, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I had the error in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah. There you found it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, it was clear. Put your coat on one of the seats there. Gold Star owner Mike tells us that his exhaust system is based on the design of Eddie Dow's ISDT gold medal winning bike with a larger tank and using information on gearing from another famous rider, Jeff Smith. Four years ago, Mike ro rode the Gold Star on a two-day trial in Burgundy, around 120 miles a day in scorching sunshine through vineyards farm tracks, forests and steep rocky goat paths on the edge of sheer drops. The Goldie performed well, he says, but the jockey was exhausted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it? 
Is it a handful? We're just we're just admiring your bike and, and wondering if it was as much of a handful as they usually are or depends how fast you want to go though. That's the problem. That's the problem. It can't be in mud and it ruts and things. Right. It's just an any fed then, Nick. Just about, I think. Yeah. Did he get here before you then? No, he didn't. Oh, he's not as quick then, is he? He was behind me. He was coming up behind me. I, I turned out the, uh, the cab, got onto the bridge, and went to the bike stop. Had to look at the yeah, paper line. Yeah, I see you. <laughs> <laughs>
flow out there. I think you. Oh, right. <laughs> Can you imagine the smug smile on my face as I change up through the gears? I see the colour of the sky ahead and it's hard to imagine that the next 60 miles will be dry. I don't claim to derive any great pleasure from riding in the rain, though riding out of it to feel the sun warming you as the roads dry beneath your wheels is certainly one of the delights of motorcycling. Not today though.
This is the town of War Boys. I'm still engaged with the blaze of lights off wet tarmac, not yet wet through and gritting my teeth against the deluge. That will come. We are still 25 miles from our dry destination. Fortunately, the modified charging system and sealed modern coil continue to supply light and sparks with utter reliability. And that's about all the comfort there is to be had until I peel off sodden gloves and wring out my socks at home.